And if you have a very high score, you might be 20 times more likely to have a heart attack. I'm here with Professor Matthew Budoff, uh, who is an expert in both cardiology, diagnostic imaging, and calcification scanning, which we're going to talk about today. So I'm delighted to meet you, Matt. Pleasure, privilege. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess the first question is, uh, what always fascinated me about calcification scanning is um, its extraordinary ability to predict events, heart events, and even all-cause mortality. So perhaps first we might talk about why the calcification scan is so powerful in its prediction. Yeah, and I think it goes back to just simple concepts. The idea that the best predictor of a life-threatening disease is the early manifestation of that disease. So patients who have calcified plaque are already building up blockages in their arteries. So it's not surprising if you're already building up blockages that you might end up needing a stent or bypass or even have a heart attack down the road. And in terms of its predictive power, the multipliers or risk multipliers or odds ratios, lots of terms for future events, are quite massive for calcification. A high score generally being a, a 10 times multiplier in terms of future risk. So maybe you've actually um, produced papers yourself on this and reviewed countless papers. Maybe talk a little around that risk multiplier. Yeah, so normally when we talk about uh, framing ham risk or risk calculators, usually if your risk is high, you're twice as likely to have a heart attack, maybe three times as likely to have a heart attack. With coronary calcium, as you mentioned, you're on, on average about 10 times more likely to have a heart attack. And if you have a very high score, you might be 20 times more likely to have a heart attack. So it's a much more robust way to identify who's at risk. And people with very high scores are at much higher risk than we can normally calculate with things like blood pressure, cholesterol, or diabetes. Absolutely. And uh, one other question, or actually a point that's raised against calcification is, but it does not see the soft plaque and often events are caused by soft plaque. Now, I believe that's a very specious argument, but perhaps you could describe the mechanisms and as to why that's really not a valid argument against it. Well, yeah, so I mean, if somebody has calcified plaque, then they have other plaque as well. We often describe calcification as the tip of the iceberg. So patients have calcified plaque, they must also have soft plaque, fibrous plaque, and all the other components. And the bigger the iceberg, the bigger the problem underneath the surface of the water. I mean, we think about the Titanic, when it saw an iceberg floating, it didn't say, let's send divers down below the surface to see if there's something that's going to destroy the ship. They knew that if they saw water, if they saw ice above the water, that there must be a bigger problem below the surface. And I see, I see calcium as the same way, that if we see calcified plaque, we know that below the surface, there must be a lot of soft plaque and a lot of dangerous plaque as well. And on the topic of progression then, I guess some people may have such rapidly progressing disease that perhaps they haven't built a lot of calcium, but I think the risk multipliers cover the gamut because they're so powerful, as we said earlier. But progression itself, I think you've also published papers on progression and its power of predicting future events. Right, and somebody whose score is increasing, especially going up rapidly, that could be by 100 points, a calcium score over a couple of years or by 20% per year, that however you define rapid progression, rapid progressors are six to eight times more likely to suffer an event. Now that's on top of the multiplier for having a high score. So you can imagine that when you start talking about having a lot of plaque and it's rapidly progressing, you've identified a patient with a very high risk state. Absolutely. And the calcification technology, I know you're involved in the film or a movie, The Widowmaker, which told the whole story. But perhaps it seems a tragedy that 30 or 40 years ago, the technology was essentially ready to go and it really didn't get adopted only more recently. So perhaps a brief history of, of how that happened and occurred and maybe culminating with the, uh, the editor of C Circulation. I think there was an incident which was very interesting. Yeah, so about 10 years ago, we had a, 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 the American Heart Association commissioned myself and as the lead author and a number of other authors 
to create a, a, a scientific statement, kind of an expert panel of the state of the art with, with cardiac CT. And we wrote up the papers, we, we analyzed the literature, we did reviews, and we came up with a, with a, with a, um, a conclusion that it was a, a robust predictor of events. Um, and that was what the American Heart Association, after careful peer review and external review, said could be published. The editor of Circulation didn't like that. He, doesn't, he wasn't a supporter of coronary calcium and he was newly appointed and he felt that he can influence what comes out in his journal and didn't want a kind of a positive statement. So he, he kind of identified or created a uh, spirit of the embargo is what he called it. And he said that because it was discussed um, um, incidentally before it was published that he would refuse to publish it. So it was delayed, it wasn't actually unpublished, it just took another year um, and it went back to the American Heart Association. They again approved it with a more powerful statement because now more science had come out and that was published in circulation. So it was just delayed for a year uh, for more personal than poli and political reasons rather than scientific. Right. And I, I perceived it as an example of cardiology's resistance to the scan, which had been going on for maybe 20 years before that point. The general resistance, what do you feel were the major factors? Uh, because I still get pushback when promoting calcification from many doctors using the same old arguments. But why do you think for 20 or 30 years there was such sustained pushback? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, remarkable. I think in the United States we made the mistake of, uh, you know, we didn't formally do it, but, but the mistake was made that people started to use this machine and advertise it to the public in advance of maybe the science coming around as quickly as it should. And I think people saw the the dramatic odds ratios and the dramatic prediction or had a personal uh, experience with it that saved their life and decided that they wanted to make this more widely available and they started marketing it directly to the consumer. And 20 years ago, there was no direct to consumer marketing. Now you can't avoid it on, on American TV. There are, there are television ads about every few minutes advertising a drug X or, or hospital Y things are being advertised directly to the consumer, but back then it wasn't. So many doctors reacted quite vehemently against coronary calcium. I think more for the concept that we shouldn't be going straight to the patient and rather go through the, the medical community. So I think that, that kind of spoiled the waters in some sense and I think caused a much bigger pushback than otherwise we would expect. I literally debated Stephen Nissen recently on this topic, and his whole debate was not the science. I presented all the positive science, and his pushback was that this is being advertised on billboards, on radio, on TV, and therefore must be bad. Which doesn't make much sense since his institution, the Cleveland Clinic, is advertised on billboards and radio and television. And I wouldn't say the Cleveland Clinic is bad because they advertise. I would say that they're good because it's a good institution. Just like I would say coronary calcium is a good test because the science has validated that it's a good test. I don't think whether or not you advertise a, a, a company or a product makes it good or bad. But that's how the pushback came about from some of the purists in the field. And of course the timing was bad as you say, advertising simply wasn't acceptable back in that period. Exactly. Um, there's a certainly been a long memory on, on the rejection because it's sustained. Recently then in the ESC guidelines, uh, American and US guidelines, it, calcification is recommended for middle risk patients where most heart attacks occur. And in some studies even 60% of those guys can be reallocated to high or low risk from middle. So the power even comes across there. Um, but even though it's in the guidelines, I think uh, myself and Dr. Gerber certainly people we know, primary care doctors, do not seem still to be really aware of it. There's a lot of ignorance still. Yeah, no, we've been trying. We've been, I mean, it's, we've published thousands of articles literally on the topic. We've tried to, to get it out, the word out there. Um, it's not like the Widowmaker talks about. It's not promoted by big business. Um, and that's, that's unfortunately the most common pathway to re-educate doctors who are already trained. So. Doctors in practice now, no longer going to a lot of lectures, seeing patients every day, 
The only way that we can educate them, unfortunately, about new products is mostly through the, the representatives from the companies, the pharmaceutical or industry representatives that pay visits to their office and drop off new articles and new science. It's all approved, it's all good science, but that's their pathway sometimes to hear about a new drug or a new device. Here, we have a device that's out there that's now been accepted, and if they don't read the guidelines, literally, they won't know about it. So getting to those doctors and educating them literally takes industry, which we don't really have in the coronary calcium field. We don't have a big business that's making money by doing calcium scoring. So there's nobody to hire drug reps or pharmaceutical reps to go to the doctor's offices to educate them on the use of the yeah. CT scanner. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge lacking, all right, um, because the industry really is built around that, as you say, that's the driving force for awareness. Uh, the Widowmaker movie, though, which I'll put a link after the, uh, on this video when it's posted, does at least tell the story and got out there somewhat, but didn't become a really big volume movie. Um, so I think yeah, a lot more awareness for the people as well will probably help, as well as the doctors. Yeah, and, and I'm hoping that the Widowmaker will continue to permeate. Yeah. You know, it's still out there and it's still obviously very, very temporal. So mm. I'm hoping that, that it will continue to... Uh, you know, make an impact. I try to talk about it with my lectures to just educate people that it's there, that they should see it. And, you know, hopefully it's been seen by millions of people, maybe not hundreds of millions, but, but it's getting there. Absolutely. It's always there and even more available recently. So uh, perhaps to change tack then, uh, a quick chat on the mechanisms of calcification, because people who are into this science, there are some who believe that, for instance, vitamin K2 can help stop the calcium getting into your arteries as if the calcium is inherently a bad thing. And then others, I, I'm guessing yourself, would see it as a response to injury, a natural calcification process to shore up damage. So maybe just some thoughts on that. Yeah, topic. and we've done some research there as well. And I think vitamin K2 is critical. I think it's a great... Uh, um, product. I think that we recently did a study just to validate that concept by looking at patients who underwent um, blood thinning with warfarin, uh, an anticoagulant that's an, an antagonist to vitamin K, and, or, or um, uh, the, one of the novel oral anticoagulants that, that anticoagulate people differently. And those patients who are on warfarin actually had more plaque progression and more calcification than those without. So I think calcium is twofold. One, it is a response to injury, uh, but I think it can also accumulate faster under certain, under certain circumstances. So I do think that things like vitamin K2 would be helpful um, to slow the plaque progression. You maybe can't stop the calcification process completely, and you certainly can't reverse it once it's embedded in the artery, but I think we can slow it with the proper treatment. And actually, that brings me to one other last thing, uh, the nuance of calcium density versus volume. So there's the overall score, but there's quite a bit of data, and from yourself too, I believe, published, that if the density is outpacing the volume growth, that may be a relatively good thing, and vice versa, with volume increasing and density not so much, could be very unstable plaque and very bad thing. Maybe, uh, is that generally correct? So I think we're, we're exploring that right now, to be honest. I think there is something to that. I think newer plaques are low density. They just start to calcify, maybe more uh, rupture-able, maybe more likely to rupture. Um, and the old stable plaques, the, the calcium that's been there for 20, 25 years, uh, really uh, may, be, may be more dense and, and maybe less worrisome. Um, so it looks darker or brighter, but it's not it's not as worrisome as the uh, less oh. dense plaque. So density may play a role. I think it makes sense. We need to further validate it. We've looked at it in one study, but we really need to validate it in other cohorts. But it is a concept that's starting to be looked at more um, among the uh, scientists and the epidemiologists. Right. And I think uh, it came up in the Widowmaker movie, you were specifically talking about uh, President Clinton that all astronauts and potential pres presidents must get a calcification scan. So I think it's probably fair to say that all people should have the opportunity. And in a sense, the fact that all presidents and astronauts must get it probably speaks to its genuine value. 
Yeah, no, and there's other examples where we force it upon people who we can force it upon. Uh, U.S. Air Force makes their pilots get it before they let them fly because they don't want to have somebody have a heart attack up there and crash their very expensive planes. Um, and obviously, an, you know, an astronaut would be a problem if they're in space and then have a heart attack. It takes uh, about 28 hours to get down from space, and that's a long time to suffer a heart attack before you can get health care. So I think they're very particular, but you're right. I think that it's something that is permeating. Um, and if it's in the executive physical for our executive here in the United States, then it probably should be in a lot of executive and general physicals for our patients in general. There's no reason to think that it would only benefit those at the top of the pecking order and not the rest of us. So there are some age requirements. I mean, we'd like to do men over the age of 40 in general, women over the age of 45, because that's the age of atherosclerosis. And those with more risk factors are at higher risk, and we'd be more inclined to scan people with one of the cardinal risk factors. So a family history of premature heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, prior smoking, would be, or, or active smoking, would be those patients that we would be most inclined to want to get in front of the camera sooner than later to make sure we're not missing the plaque because we have probably a 20-year lag from when we find the calcium till it causes a heart attack. But if we wait 19 years to do the scan, then we have one year to act. And if we wait 20 years, they have their heart attack, and then it's too late. So we really want to catch it well in advance of the heart attack when we can change lifestyle, diet, maybe implement some therapies to, to make a difference. I'm just curious, so is it somewhere in writing the president or the astronauts or the Air Force have to get it? Uh, no, I mean, uh, well, certainly the presidents, you can Google any president and calcium score and see their results. So uh, I know that Trump had a score in the 50s. I know Hillary Clinton had a score of zero. Obama had a score of zero. Um, President Bush had a low score. I don't remember the exact number, but he had a low score. Um, and uh, Clinton, Bill Clinton, had a score over 1,000. Actually, um, the movie never specified, and I was always curious, what was the score? Because they didn't really react to it. Over yeah, a thousand. Over a thousand, oh, yeah. Wow. That was after he left office. So that was yeah. the, the nidus that, that started the whole process, was Bill Clinton, had a, after he got out of office, after he had all these executive physicals that didn't disclose a problem, he had a calcium score that was over a thousand, and that, that led him down the road that ultimately led him to get bypass surgery. Um, uh, he developed symptoms and needed bypass, but he was not aware of his disease um, until it was very late in the game, and they missed it eight times in eight executive physicals during his eight years in office. So that's what changed the algorithm and amp implemented a calcium score. So I don't know if it's, I'm sure it's written down in somewhere in their protocols, but I don't know of a public space where it says the president must must obtain a calcium score, but it's definitely part of their, their executive physical protocols. Um, and uh, same with the astronauts and U.S. Air Force, it's part of their protocols. I don't know if they made those, make those public or not, but I know that they all get the scans as part of, an, as part of their job. And it makes absolute sense, and even if you take the president, there are so relatively few presidents, but even within that small number in the past few decades, one of them is a, a over a thousand with no risk factors person. Right. <laughs> What's the chances? Uh, because those people are everywhere. Yeah. I guess. They're yeah, yeah, no, you millions. can imagine if you yeah. multiply those six yeah. names I mentioned to to the, you know, Pop hundreds day. of millions of pop <laughs> patients, it, it starts adding up. A lot of Clintons out there. Yeah. Well on that note, let's hope that we can get the message of calcification out much more widely in the coming years and uh, many more people can benefit from it. Yeah, Thank we, you. we certainly appreciate your efforts in helping uh, spread the word as well. It certainly helps to have uh, multiple people uh, talking about it. Oh, well, thanks very much, Matt. Delighted to meet you, and we'll catch you again sometime, maybe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.